I've been doing this for so many years and I hated exercise. I hated being physically uncomfortable. I hate running. I hate the first 20 minutes of yoga. I hate it. But what I love is the, sec the seconds afterward and how I feel and how much energy I have and how well I sleep. Improve your digestion fast by using Masszymes from Bioptimizers. Click the link in the description or pinned comment below to save 20% in November. Tony, welcome to the podcast. How you doing? Jesse, I'm, I'm great, man. How are you today? I'm doing really great. Uh, did a lot of digging into your story to prepare for this, and uh, you have a really inspiring one that goes way back. And I want to start actually taking things back to when you were a kid. And I know for you, you know, you started out, things weren't so easy. You had uh, a speech impediment. You were bullied as a kid. You weren't into work. You weren't into exercise. And look who you've become today. So we're going to, let's take it from the early days and talk about what that was like as a kid and, and why you were the way you were. Well, you know, um, a lot of it had to do with the fact that maybe we moved around a lot as a kid. You know, my father was in the military, he was in the army, and so we moved because of that. And then he got different jobs and he moved because of that. So seven times before fifth grade. So I never got really got a chance to settle into one little community and make friends that were life, lifelong friends. So that was difficult. And then, um, you know, I had probably, you know, I mean, back in the 50s and 60s, it was undiagnosed, but I probably had ADD and, and, and ADHD and Elemental P and NYPD Blue. I had all the acronyms back then as a young boy. Um, and I had this speech thing. It was called cluttering from my research as I got older. And I think it was just, you know, a lot of it had to do with insecurity and the inability to be able to just slow down and, and say what I wanted to say. I was incredibly insecure and and yeah, and I was bullied as as a result, and it was not a, not an easy start. But I think what happens to a lot of people that are in my circumstances, and that's a lot of kids today, a lot of kids, you know, throughout the eons, that either you overcome it or you don't, you know. And I I just didn't like being unhappy, and so I would, you know, I would uh, break out a tape recorder and I would I would read out loud until it sounded halfway decent, and and of course as a young actor and stuff like that, those types of uh, Lessons and courses helped me, you know, become more confident and slow things down. And then building my vocabulary certainly helped a little bit too. Just being able to find the words so that I could be, you know, I could be succinct and and clear about what I wanted to say. That that helped too. So, yeah. And then the fitness came in much later. Uh, that was sort of a an accident. But yeah, that was those were the early days. Not not fun, not easy. But but without them, I don't think I'd be who I am now. You got into it a little bit there, talking about working on that speech impediment. At what point did things start to turn around for you? Uh, middle school, high school, you know, so first through mm, sixth was brutal. <laughs> you know I mean? As a young, young kid, you know, before school, I, mean, I didn't really, I didn't realize that I'd be a target, you know, all of a sudden then you are. So, I mean, I joined the uh, drama, drama classes and the drama club and stuff like that, and and I found a community that was very acceptable to me, and and um, you know they didn't they weren't judging me. I didn't have big roles or anything. Um, uh, you know, I had some learning disabilities. I would have to take some classes, uh, summer school and stuff like that, just to kind of catch up with other kids. Um, a lot of it was just based on the fact that I didn't think I could learn. I didn't think I could figure things out. You know, so a lot of it was uh, was was. Mm, what's the word look I'm looking for here? Um, my own personal interpretations of how to survive. That That's how I got by. And my father was, uh, he had a job after the military where he was gone Monday through Fridays. I mean, he was a, he was an engineer and a salesman and he would travel all over New England. And, <clears throat> and I was basically raised by my mother and I had two sisters. So I didn't have, I was the oldest and I was the only boy. So I was a little bit isolated that way as well. But what was cool was I found a, a group of friends Early on in high school, uh, you know, who knows how you gravitate to each other? There was no one was a was the captain of the hockey team. The other one was this like the the greatest athlete in the school. You know, one guy was a was a class clown. This guy Howie was just hilarious. Um, you know, uh, one other guy was a, one of the smartest kids in school. Had the highest GPA of school. I mean, it was like I was I ended up with me. I shouldn't have been with these guys because they were all much cooler than I was. 
but they just kind of, you know, brought me under their wing and, and we all became fast friends and we're still close friends today. I mean, that's 50 years ago, man. So, um, yeah, so it just goes to show you that those kinds of friendships early on can sometimes, you know, pull you out of some pretty dark places. And uh, I was lucky that I had them, honestly. So as you're going through these times and changing like we all do in our teens, what did you plan on becoming when you got older? Or did you know at that point? Oh, hell no, man. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, I wanted to be an actor. I mean, I was a performer. I mean, I was in the drama club and I wanted to be a great athlete. I just wasn't. You know, my father was his three captains, uh, sport, basketball, football, baseball. He was his big jock as a kid. And uh, but his father and his coaches were very militant about the process of getting better. And my father hated it. He just hated the berating and the screaming and the yelling. And you're either a winner or you're a loser. And life is hard. And you, you know what I mean. It was just they, they, they was such they was there was no joy in it for my father, even though he was probably gifted and athletic. But he left me alone. He you know he I wish I had some guidance, but he just didn't have that experience as a kid. So he didn't know how to you know I'm not, I don't want to say coddle me, but he didn't know how to gently help me improve my skills. And so he just thought, I'll, I'll leave him alone and let him kind of develop on his own, which, you know, left me out in the middle of nowhere, really. But um, yeah, so so that was that was another one of my my struggles early on, just just not an athletic kid <clears throat> by any means. And, and I took a weightlifting course in college, which was life changing for me. And I thought, oh, this will be an easy A. It's one credit. I'll go in there. And I was a scrawny. I was scrawny and pudgy and uh, commonly known back in those days as skinny fat. And I liked intramural sports. I loved playing, you know, whatever, flag football or playing hoop or whatever, or, or you know, frisbee was my thing. I got pretty good at that. Um, and then I took this weightlifting course. And in the and, and what was amazing about it, which is, you know, and to this day, I wish, and I even went, I even went back to the university to see if they could find this guy's this guy's records, this coach, this trainer, this teacher of mine. And I just couldn't. And and uh, what was great about him was he had a great sense of humor, and he broke it down really simply. And he said, hey, look, Rome wasn't built in a day, and you guys are gonna not going to be good at a lot of this stuff. You guys and gals weren't going to be good at this stuff early on. But if you keep coming to class and you keep working out it, you know, uh, occasionally and you work on some cardio and I can show you how to do that. And I just I just was thrilled to go there, you know, I and mean, I was weak as a chicken early on. <clears throat> and um, and then at the end of the semester, you know, I was pretty jacked and uh, and everybody was just looking at me like, what in the world happened to you? And then my GPA went up that semester for some reason. You know, little did I know that I was releasing norepinephrine and dopamine and serotonin and, you know, BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, all these. But I learned that later. I learned that, you know, when I'm reading like Sanjay Gupta's books or or, uh, or uh, John Rady's books. Uh, oh, wow, all this fitness stuff really does help you mentally and emotionally as well. But, you know, and, and then so I came out to California and then, wow, every, everybody's working out here. There are gyms in every corner. This is really cool. So that, that was those were the early days. And in the early days, you obviously were, you know, starting to feel better, look better. You're getting into it. Was nutrition part of that at that time for you? Did you get into diet and, and bring that piece in or was that later on? No, I was too broke to be able to figure out diet. It was just hot dogs and burgers and and tacos and pizza and beer and yeah, I I you know, because I was a skinny kid. I was I mean, if you look at body types, I was certainly an ectomorph. You know, I was a, I was a scrawny. My parents were both lean and thin people and they made another version of that. And that was me. So, you know, with a metabolism of a of a of a of a 20 year old or early 30 year old, uh, I could get away with murder back in those days. Um, but that changed, you know, that changed because I, I, I learned later after I started doing the exercises that the food was as critical as the exercise, not, not necessarily for, for, uh, the look of my body, just for the actual health of my organs and stomach and, and intestines and everything else. And, um, so I, you know, there was no such thing as keto and paleo back in those days. It just, those things just didn't exist. You know, either you were vegetarian, that was like the big alternative choice early on in the early eighties. And some people were vegan, but they were freaks, you know, like, what are you, you don't eat meat or fish or chicken. I mean, holy cow. And so I, my, my plan was just to be kind of a pescatarian, you know, fish, a fish eating vegetarian. So I still had dairy and I still had soy and I was still eating, you know, whole wheat bread and, and I was having a lot of gut issues and didn't realize that I that I had leaky gut probably for decades, you know, and I learned that only only four or five years ago. 
you know, and, and that that evolved so many different ways. Like if you read my book, The Big Picture, you know, I talk at that time, I was sort of a pescatarian. I was a plant-based guy who ate fish and occasionally had chicken and, and beef. And now I'm pure vegan. I've been vegan for almost five months. And uh, and I figured it out this time. I tried veganism twice before and it was too many too many vegan crackers and too many vegan chips and too many vegan snacks as opposed to eating just plants, you know, just eating uh, vegetables and and uh, and a really good plant-based uh, protein shake, which is now, you know, I have my own um, uh, power life. So, um, yeah, so that was a, that was an evolution. And I've settled into this veganism. And, you know, I mean, I was in Jackson Hole uh, a couple of weeks ago and I had some elk medallions because, you know, the damn elk was probably alive the day before and now it's on my plate. You know what I mean? It's, it's about as organic as it can get. You know, I'm not militant about it. I just I just find that right now I can maintain my weight. I don't have the inflammation that I had before in my joints. My digestion is just, you know, finally, you know, I'm not dealing with diarrhea or constipation or bloating or or fatigue from eating the wrong kinds of food. So this is this is where I am now, but I'm always changing. Like my fitness, the way I train now is completely different than it was even five years ago. You know, I mean, I'm always you know, always looking at what's new and what I'm interested in. And those, and that's the direction I move in until I change my mind, you know. Let's talk a little bit more about this, this current vegan experiment. You mentioned doing it two other times in the past and, and then, you know, pivoting away. And then you also mentioned the, the elk there and incorporating that. So the way I'm understanding it is vegan day to day, but then if you have access to really good quality meat, you'll incorporate that sporadically. Well, I mean, in five months, I had I had elk once, <laughs> you know what I mean. So it's pretty sporadic, yeah. It's pretty sporadic, but yeah, I don't I don't see myself eating. I don't I have don't miss fish at all. I don't miss chicken at all. And I don't, I'm I'm not you know I'm not a proponent of any particular eating style. You know, a lot of people are vegan or paleo or vegetarian or pescatarian, and they're doing this thing for whatever all the, sometimes for all the wrong reasons, and they think it's the the it's the and they don't, I don't I don't I think a lot of times people don't do it because it's trendy, but it's it's in the news or it's in the general ether, and so they think okay uh, this and this and this hasn't worked before I'm going to jump on this train now, and uh, and maybe it'll work temporarily because they're disciplined with it you know they're watching the calories or the quality of whatever they're doing you know they're not they're sticking out they're staying away from from the fat, sugar, salt, and chemicals that, that exist in a lot of other kinds of food. And then, and then all of a sudden, if it stops working, people just keep going. You know, and I know, I know there's a friend of mine who was vegan forever. She was anemic forever. She had low energy all the time. She had digestive issues all the time. And she went to one nutritionist after another, and they said, you know, you're, you're not really supposed to be a vegan, you know. You should have some fish once in a while. And she fought it tooth and nail, you know. And, and, and to this day, I mean, I haven't seen her uh, much since the pandemic, but, and I don't, I'm, I'm curious to see where she is, if she's actually incorporating fish, meat, and chicken occasionally with her plant, her plant-based diet. But, um, yeah, if it's broke, fix it. If it's, if it's not broke, then leave it alone. And presently five or six months into veganism, it's good. It's working good. You know, so will I have some elk again, or will I have a beautiful piece of wild salmon? Yeah, probably. I'll probably dabble. Was there something specific that was broke that brought you to the vegan diet or what was it at that time that brought you around for round number three? In round number two, at the end of round number two, which is you think about this, like, why would I go back to veganism? Uh, I ended up with Ramsey-Hunt syndrome and the Ramsey-Hunt syndrome was, syndrome was brought on by just pure stress. So if I had chicken pox and so if you had chicken pox as a kid, then the shingles virus is sitting in there waiting just to, you know, emerge sometimes on your neck, sometimes your torso. You know, anywhere. I got it in my ear, right? Which is about the worst place you can get it. And so um, when you get shingles in your ear, the nerves in your ear that control sight and smell and taste and balance get fried, right? And so when I got Ramsey Hunt in October 2017, I couldn't walk, I couldn't drive, I couldn't work out, I couldn't get out of bed, I couldn't really eat because every time I ate, I would throw up. And this went on for weeks and weeks and months and months and months. And uh, it'll be four years in October, this coming October. So um, it was time for me to really look at what I'm doing more closely. And I was, I thought I was doing everything right. You know, I mean, I was working out regularly. I wasn't controlling my stress. So I was eating well, but I didn't realize that I had, I had issues with wheat, soy, corn, and dairy. So I got a bunch of blood work and worked with this nutritionist and this other gal up in upstate New York, um, Tammy Murphy, who really goes 
deep into, you know, leaky gut issues. So I had, I had leaky gut. Oops. Like, what the heck is that? It's just, you know, leaky gut, if you're not familiar with what that is, it's just that the food ends up, you know, um, as it's making its way through your intestines, um, doesn't stay there because your intestines are, are, aren't these solid cement walls. They're very porous. And if you're eating foods that create inflammation, which for me was wheat, soy, corn, and dairy, along with sesame seeds, spinach, onions. I mean, we did a full panel. It was 130 pages. It had every food that existed. Like think about all the fish and think about all the meat, the kinds of meat. Think about all the kinds of plants. It was 130, like every food that you can imagine. And it came down. And most people who have leaky gut have, have wheat, soy, corn, and dairy issues to some extent. So that you automatically get off of that, right? And like, okay, that's wheat. Oh, that's in all the bread and all the food I eat. And then soy is everywhere because it's in a lot of, you know, frozen, healthy, healthy frozen foods. And then when the other ha tomatoes, couldn't have tomatoes. So I, I, mean, I got off all this stuff for about three months and I healed my leaky gut. And, um, um, uh, and then I was, you know, then I was going to rehab, right, for my, my balance issues. So when Ramsey Hunt had sort of began to heal, I had Bell's palsy. I, I mean, my face, I look like the, I look like the, uh, elephant man, you know, it was crazy. And that went away after a while. And then I just got back to my regime. I, I mean, I was weak as could be, you know, I could, I could barely do 10, 10 or 15 push-ups when normally I could do 50, you know, or I could barely do like three or four pull-ups when I could normally do 30. And it was a long road back, but because I had that discipline, I was able to come all the way back. And, to, and here's what's kind of crazy. Four years later, I'm almost normal. A year ago, I couldn't have said that because I would still have these bouts of something called uh, bilateral vestibular hypofunction, which is a form of vertigo. Now, vertigo, it's sort of the room is spinning. This is not spinning. This just feels like Parkinson's inside my brain. And it would come and go based on light, based on fatigue, based on being now malnourished. Like, you know, I'm, I'm always very conscious. I've got this bar and this water. Uh, you know, I can't be dehydrated. I can't be malnourished. I can't be sleep deprived. You know, I have to be really careful when I, when I go into bright light, I make sure that I have sunglasses on. So I'm doing all this and exercising and eating right and, and, you know, being a vegan, it seems to be working. So th there's a lot of steps to get super healthy when coming, coming back from Ramsey Hunt syndrome and bilateral vestibular hypofunction. Terms I had never heard of. When I went to the ER and I was desperately ill and my wife didn't know what to do, I, I, we, we thought I had a stroke. But I was going through contract negotiations with Beachbody and I was flabbergasted on, on, you know, like, are you kidding me? 20 years of service and this is what you're going to do? I was just, I just couldn't believe it. And I also, uh, my friend Tom Petty, who, you know, everybody knows who Tom Petty passed away, you know, an accidental overdose, which was just excruciating. And then I had friends that were at the Vegas shooting, um, which... You know, they would tell these horror stories. I, I, I was, there were so many things going on, the contract, Tom passing, all that was happening like within a one week period of time. And I just couldn't handle it, man. And, um, and stress is one of these things that just slowly creeps up on you and uh, any number of things can happen, you know? And for me, it was shingles in my ear. Oops, what a bummer. Um, but it was a wake up call. It was a wake up call. So this new program that I've created called the Power of Four integrates um, mindfulness and meditation, which was, which is, didn't really exist for me. I would meditate once in a while because I thought it was cute and people were doing it. So I could say I was doing it, but I wasn't really doing it. And then, um, and then I, you know, I read up on it more because all the, all the doctors and all the physical therapists and all the acupuncturists and all the tinctures and potions and all the King's men and all the King's horses couldn't put me back together again, man. And so I had to do my own research and I worked with these two folks that, you know, took out a bunch of blood and checked my urine and checked my fecal matter, checked everything, man. My spit, I spit, you know what I mean? And it's just like, you know, when the science is there and if you believe in the science, either, either, you, either you try it or you don't. And I thought, I, I, I'm so miserable, I have to do something. And so there's your long-winded answer as to why I'm vegan now. Um, and, and, uh, and I was afraid to do vegan again because I was vegan when I got sick. But, but I realized it wasn't, it wasn't the veganism. It was the fact that I wasn't eating the healthiest foods in the world and that I was stressed out of my mind. And, uh, and that, I think a lot of that stress just comes from who I've become. You, you know, when you're kind of a lazy kid and you live in a little two bedroom apartment with a view of the convalescent home and, and you're 60 grand in debt and you got a broken down old Mustang and you know what I mean? You're just living on, you know, and you're young. 
and you're just training some folks and, and doing an occasional commer TV commercial or something. Life is simple, but when life becomes super complicated, you know, when you're trying to, you know, knock the ball out of the park every time you show up to, into a studio, that can be stressful after a while if you don't know what to do. And so it was it was probably the, the, the most important lesson of my life because now, you know, life is it's hard. It's still hard. I mean, I I'm on tonal now. So they're always calling me to make sure I do those workouts. I've created my own workout program with 25 new workouts called The Power of Four. You know, I have my own supplement line called Power Life with a, with a parent company, Golden Hippo. I have a fitness equipment line. So I've given myself even more to do. But I can manage these things at my pace, my way with my people without, you know, without, I'm not going to say big brother, but all the big, you know, all these companies breathing down my neck. So um, even though there's a lot to do, my wife and I seem to manage pretty well. And, and we're, and, and, you know, Tonal is a, is a, is a fun product. It's pretty amazing. There's nothing like it on the market and it's a great organization to work with. So I love doing that. And then creating my own program without having to you know, be told what, to, how to sequence things or what to call things or how long the workouts have to be or who the cast members have to be. It's really fun to be able to, it's been a tremendous learning experience, but, but, and the vegan diet, uh, just allows me to sort of sleep well and wake up ready to go and, and, um, and take on the day and, and fall asleep right away. I mean, you know, it's these little subtle things, you know, a lot of people have sleep issues and it could be what they're putting in their mouth. You know what I mean? Um, um, I'm reading um, James Nestor's book, Breath. What a powerful book on just, on. it's not meditation. It's just all these breathing techniques and, and mouth breathing. Who knew that mouth breathing was about the worst thing you could do in the world? And so, you know, I take my mouth at night. I mean, I'm doing some crazy stuff, Jesse. <laughs> I'm doing that too. James is a previous guest on the show. So big fan of his work. Oh man, I'd love to meet him. Uh, it's, his book has had a huge impact on me. It's been amazing. He's incredible. So what I'm gathering from all that, Tony, just to kind of summarize when it comes to the vegan diet part, there's a lot we can get into and a lot that I'm sure we will get into, but it was from the Ramsey Hunt syndrome. There was some residual symptoms that you're experiencing, and it sounds like the vegan diet was a piece of that puzzle to try and get you know even better and back to your regular self. Yep. And is your wife on this diet too? No. No, she's kind of a pay, paleo keto kind of gal, right? So, I mean, she's, you know, she's 17 years younger than I am. She's got her own, you know, she does a lot of orange theory and, and Pilates and, and yoga. And she's got her sort of technique. And, you know, I'm in the backyard doing a ninja course with guys half my age. So she's not going to participate in any of that, right? And um, she and I will do cardio together uh, once in a while, which is always nice to have her there doing that with me. Um, and we ride bikes. We just got e-bikes. And so that's our new favorite thing to do. And, uh, but yeah, so the, 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 she's just, you know, she's a, a meat eater and a fish eater and she doesn't really do chicken. She was kind of over the chicken as well. But, uh, yeah, so we have two different sections in the freezer. We got two different sections in the fridge and we got two different sections in the pantry. Um, so yeah, we've made it work. Nice. And who does the cooking? Well, be, she's so darn busy that she'll like there are there are periods where she'll cook almost every night for a week and then she won't cook for a whole week. So, um, you know, I'll go down to the local Air One and I'll go to the deli and I'll get every vegetable that they have in the deli fresh and I'll put those in the fridge. And then, you know, just and then I'm, um, I, I like the Beyond Meat the sausage, the breakfast sausage patties, which are insane. So a lot of times I'll take those vegetables different sausage patties, put them in the air fryer and that'll be my lunch. That'll be my dinner. Um, or she'll cook, you know, it's just sort of hit and miss. But the go-to for me has been Fire Road, home, uh, plant-based home delivery. So uh, Brendan Brazier, who's the creator of Vega, I should, have you ever had Brendan on? Oh my God, he'd blow your mind. No, not at this he, point. He is, he's fabulous. And he's really accommodating. Like if I told him, hey, you know, Jesse was awesome. It was a great podcast. He'd, he'd come on. But, you know, he's a savant when it comes to that. I mean, he's a long distance runner and a marathoner and ultra marathoner. And he lives in Malibu and he rides his bike to my house for the workout. Like, what? Are, what, are, what? I mean, it's like, I don't, he has to, I mean, that's a long way and there's lots of hills and he just shows up all sweaty and works out. But because of him, he introduced me to um, uh, uh, David who runs Fire Road. And I've tried them all, man. I'm not going to name names, but you start getting like these plant-based things and, and after like the second week, it all starts tasting the same. But but Fire Road is, 
There's something really unique and special and specific and super clean what they do. And, um, and they accommodate my wheat, soy, corn, and dairy issue too. So they custom. And so I, I, I'll eat those, I'll eat those fire road meals at least 50% of the time, you know, and breakfast, I got breakfast. Breakfast is some kind of a puff cereal or, you know, some, uh, usually a shake in the morning. Uh, but lunch and dinner, man, um, it's either fire road, my wife or my little concoctions that I get at the local deli, you know. So Tony, it's been five months, still relatively new being back in this diet. You mentioned the sleep piece there. Have you noticed anything specific in that sleep realm? or other areas of your life at this point already that have improved since going back to veganism? Oh my God. I don't have to get up and pee two or three times a night. I don't, I don't just wake my, my mind is not scrambling before I go to bed, you know? Um, you know, if you're doing some sort of a, so a, I'm taping my mouth. So now I'm getting, you know, completely different quality of air through my nose. Right. And, uh, and B, when you go to bed, Typically, I'd go to bed, and I, I was pretty good at falling asleep most nights. Seventy-five percent of this, just hit, my wife would say, "Holy crap, man! You're you're out cold within seventeen seconds." But twenty-five percent of the time, I wasn't. You know, I'm sitting there staring at the ceiling, thinking about work, thinking about this. You know, your mind just starts to like you know the, I, I call them pre dreams. There's a bunch of nonsense in your head that doesn't make any sense. You're awake and you can kind of stop and go, "What is, what the heck am I thinking right now? It's, none of this makes any sense," or you're worrying about. Well, you know, maybe I didn't edit that right. Or maybe, you know, maybe that conversation I had with that person could have been better. There's all these thoughts. But when I do that, I don't know if you remember, if you've read the book, Breath, but there's this 5.5 breathing technique, 5.5, 5. 5, on average, five, and this is out of uh, Nestor's book, that simple technique of 5.5 second inhales and 5.5 second exhales, I fall asleep. I don't even, I don't think I get to 10 of them and I'm out cold, you know? I mean, it's just sort of amazing. And, and I do it in the car, I do it all everywhere and anywhere, along with other types of meditation, you know, um, other, other ones like four by four breathing and, and simple, you know, just normal inhalations, exhalations, sitting in a nice, you know, nice, comfortable room and, and on a pillow or something, you know, but, but the one thing about that technique, it's like that, I can do that anywhere. I could, if you're asking me a long enough question, I can do it right now. You know what I mean? And it's, and I didn't know about any of this stuff. And I thought it was all hogwash and, and meditation, sh meditation. Yeah. Well, get Ramsey Hunt syndrome, man. And, uh, and get vestibular hypofunction and you're going to, you're going to start breathing. You know what I mean? And that's why I do a lot of yoga. I mean, I have, a, I, in my new program, there's a morning, there's three yoga workouts, not one, like with P90X, there's three, all three are different. All of them are three different lengths because yoga is to me is the is single most perfect thing you can do if you want to stay young and healthy because it's 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 balance it's flexibility it's strength and it's mindfulness and all you need is the floor and you don't even need shoes and you can do it naked you can do it any way you want in your boxer shorts whatever and you can do it you know you can do it in the living room you can do it in the garage you can do it out in the yard you can do it anywhere and it's a moving meditation if you're adding the breathing component to yoga and it has, you know, has those other really important components. And what yoga, the reason why yoga was in P90X and the reason why there are three in this program is because if anybody knows anything about exercise science is that it, it's also a recovery process, right? It's allowing your, your tendons and your joints and your muscles and your ligaments to be, it's preparing them for pull-ups and push-ups and biceps curls and all these other things, you know what I mean? And cardio you know, because of the strength and the range of motion, the balance components, um, you know, I mean, it's really everything. And, and if, I think if more Americans did it, they would be, uh, they'd be in less pain and they'd have less fatigue and they'd be more productive. For sure. Have you always been somebody that's been well aware and practicing that recovery phase? Or is this something you've had to learn the hard way? Learn it the hard way. I learned foam, foam rolling the hard way. I don't have one. I have three Theraguns, all from different companies, man. You know what I mean? Like getting in a bathtub with Epsom salts and just sitting there for a half hour or an hour. You know, uh, we have an infrared sauna in the house. You know, I mean, you look at, you look at any professional athlete who has, has an extended career, they, they spend millions of dollars on physical therapists and massage therapists and, and um, um, 
you know, ice baths and jacuzzis and, and, and all of it. You know what I mean? Uh, 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 what are those chambers? I'm forgetting those chambers where you freeze, freeze your butt off. Uh, cryo. Cryo, right. Cryo. The, all these compression sleeves that you see on professional athletes, right? These, these things that just, right? So uh, even the clothing, like even compression clothing is, is, is part of, you know, helping your muscles, um, uh, get less fatigue while, you know, doing really hard things. So, you know, that's, a, you know, back in the old days, you just did it. You just went to the gym and you worked out and you played sports and then, you you know, um, but you can extend your, you can, I mean, I'm 63, right? So um, I, I'm not, can I jump as high as I used to? No. Can I run as fast as I used to? No. But I'm in general, in a lot of respects, stronger than I've ever been. Because I, you know, I have I have a twenty five foot rope. I got a seventeen foot rope. I've got two different pegboards. I got a ninja course in the backyard. I got parallel bars. I got, you know, I work on handstands all, all the time, right? Um, yeah. So, you know, a lot of people just get they do the yoga and the yoga is great. And after a while, the yoga isn't as good as it used to be because you're not doing all these other things. So the power of four P ninety X P ninety X two all these different programs forced everybody to work on their weaknesses as much or more so than their strengths. And, and I still do that. I love being introduced to things that I'm horrible at. Cause I think, Oh my God, think of this incredible learning curve. And I already know it from the get go. My learning curve is long. I don't, even as a fit person, I don't pick up anything new right away. It's just not going to happen. So people look at me and go, wow, I'm surprised you can't do that. I go, eh, in about four months I will. I know my deal. And that's when a lot of people quit. That's when I used to quit. Like, Oh, I'm not good at this. So I quit. Oh, wow. You just missed out on so many beautiful lessons. You you know what I mean? It's like, who goes from first grade to ninth grade, then ninth grade to grad school? No, man. It's, you got to go. And this takes time. This takes decades to go from first grade to grad school. And you want to be fit in three weeks? What are you, out of your mind? You know what I mean? So, you know, anyway, I'm going off on a tangent here, but uh, I, I- No, that's great. Antonia, as somebody who has been into fitness so long and maintaining their fitness, you talked there a little bit about, you know, now you can't jump as high. You said it's a little bit different. Like you, you have certain aspects that are maybe even better than when you're younger, but what was that like for you being somebody who had so much of their identity wrapped up in being Mr. Fitness and being in the public eye? A, when did you notice things started to slow down for you? And how did you cope with that? Well, you, you know, not that many things slowed down for me, honestly. Uh, I was uh, my mo- the most push-ups I ever did was 100, 110 in a row, way back in the day. The most pull-ups I've ever done is thirty-eight. Now, the fact that I only can do about sixty-five in a row now, I don't know, that doesn't really bother me. I don't, I don't care. I, I think if I really pushed it, if I really, because you know, when I could do one hundred and ten, every Monday for five years, I did five hundred push-ups. I mean, I didn't do them in a row. But that was my Monday workout. Now, if I went back to my old Monday workout of 500 push-ups, I could probably do 80, 90, 100 again. You know, if I, if I, whatever. Um, same thing with pull-ups. You know, I mean, I, I, I do more ninja stuff now. Pull-ups are, a, you know, a really sort of basic, full range of motion thing. Pull-ups, chin-ups, whatever you want to do. Now I'm doing a lot of rope climbing and ninja core stuff and pegboards, which requires lock-off strength. Which lock-off strength means you're not doing it. You're just c- kind of grabbing here so you're doing all this isometric work i mean uh eight years ago i couldn't get through a ninja course there's no way i didn't have the forearm and hand strength i mean you know i just it wouldn't so there's a whole lot of things that i'm more interested in now that are more skill-based and athletic-based that i can do that i wouldn't have had a chance of doing i mean in the middle of p90x i started climbing ropes i couldn't get up a 15-foot rope i could do 100 push-ups but I couldn't get up a 15 foot rope. I just thought the rope, climbing the rope is more interesting than the push ups. So I, I don't care. And I don't, I don't run, I don't sprint anymore. I don't, you know what I mean? So if, if I went to, a, if I went, if I changed everything and I just took a, I had a, a track coach and I was over at the UCLA track over here three times a week working on speed, I could, I, I'm pretty sure I would get fast again. But, you know, and that there's sort of the ebb and flow of what interests me and what I find, you know, fun. I do, I do cardio on Mondays. I do plyo on Wednesdays. And I do another plyo core workout on Fridays. Not every Friday because sometimes that's my day off um, because I'm a skier. 
And, uh, you know, and I, uh, skiing is probably my next favorite thing other than my wife and my three dogs. And so I want to get on, I want to go to a mountain and I want to rip. I mean, I want to, I want I mean, I've been heli skiing and I love to heli ski and I love to, you know, I love to, I'm not a backcountry guy because I don't like to hike so much with skis on my back. It doesn't sound interesting to me. I like chairlifts and, and trams and gondolas, but I just want to be able to get on a mountain and fly. You know what I mean? So those are the things I focus on. My skiing, I'm a better skier now at 63 than I was at 53 or 43 or 23 or 13 by a mile because that's where I put my focus and attention. So to answer your question, yeah, I'm not good at some things now like I used to be because I don't do them. (laughs) You know what I mean? But the things that I do enjoy, I'm as good or better than I've ever been at my age. So, I mean, will I be that way at 83? I don't know. It's hard to say, but. I mean, I, I surprise myself. I have a four-hour workout at my backyard with a bunch of young guys. And every week I think, because, you know, there's one exercise where we climb up a, 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 be- a pegboard all the way up to the top. And then there's a beam that goes, that supports, it's on a wall that supports the patio of my house. With well, legs, we go up the beam. Then we have to ring a bell. And the bell is like this way the hell over here. And then we go down a 17-foot rope. Then we go up the 17-foot rope. And then we ring the bell. We go down the beam. We go across the pegboard. And then... We do maximum pull-ups on a pull-up bar, but not on the bar, on these really wonky, <laughs> like every time I look at that exercise, I think this is the week. I'm not going to be able to do that this week. You know what I mean? People who come for the first time, some of the fittest people, collegiate, professional, they look at that thing and go, ain't no way I'm doing that. That's scary as hell. And uh, and sometimes they don't, sometimes they do, but they don't usually get, they get, they'll get, maybe get down the rope, but there's no way they're going back up. And so that to me is just it's, that's just a super intense, super scary, highly skill based thing. Like I, I've got guys who don't who used to, you know, do it. They don't come to the workout anymore because it's too intimidating. And they're and they're in their forties and then their thirties. They just look at that exercise and they go, "This scares the crap out of me, man. I, I don't want to do that." And I go, "Well, I guess I guess you're it's officially time. You're getting old. Like you peaked. And if you don't want to do that exercise, it's going that way." You know what I mean? They don't find that very funny. But I mean, that's what life is. You know, I I mean, when you're a kid, you're looking at the world like this. Like, it's just, it's, you know, there are fears and there are trepidations and there's some, you know, poor parenting and there's some bullying and all these kinds of things. But, you know, open up a door and go through, open up a door. You know, I always say, and I say it in my book, do scary things that don't kill you. You know, you might get, you might break a bone or you might get some stitches, but. But, uh, and I never used to think that way. Oh my God. I was, I was, I was afraid to leave the house when I was a kid. So, but my life is a hell of a lot more interesting now. You know what I mean? And knock on wood, I've shattered kneecaps and broken my nose three times and torn my biceps tendon and, and almost compound fractured my tib fib on my left leg. And, and my legs look like somebody, you know, like I'm a mixed martial artist because they're covered in scars, you know, but it's just, you know, life here, here's life. Birth, school, work, death. That's it. Birth, <laughs> birth, school, work, death. What are you doing in between? You know what I mean? Like there's something, there's stuff. And, you know, uh, in, here in the USA, the pursuit of happiness is in the Constitution. And whatever makes you happy, you know what I mean? If it's drugs and alcohol and being mean to people, I don't know. It doesn't sound like a good, good way to go. But if you hang out with some really, you know, I talk about uh, in, in my book, just finding the right kind of people, you know. What, how do you stay accountable? You stay accountable with people who are living large and taking charge and having a full life. And if you got a bunch of naysayers and finger pointers and haters, <clears throat> and they're your friends, you're like, ugh, how long do you want to keep those folks around? You know. So, um, again, another tangent, Jesse. I apologize. Keep them coming. It's great. I want to pivot that same question a little bit. And we talked about before that that last tangent. You know as you're getting older, the changes and and what you can do and what you can't do. And it sounds like, you know, you're very happy with, and you should be, I'm looking at you right now and you're very fit and you're 63 or you look incredible. But what about 2017 Ramsey Hunt syndrome hits you? And again, this must've been a time that was so trying for your identity because it totally, you know, stopped you from doing all the things you love and being fit and being active Let's talk about that point in your life and and what that was like physically and mentally. Well, you know, it was horrible. I mean, it was horrible. 
it's funny though when you're in the middle of it you're you're just trying to survive you know you're just trying to f- survive let's say you're you're halfway up the kumbu icefall on everest you know what i mean and you're out you're coming out of camp 2 trying to go in, well camp actually it's between the base and camp 1 you know you're so focused on just not falling into a crevasse right it's just like here i am and i got my sherpas and i got the rope and i got the the crampons on and I'm trying to get across this ladder and you're just focused on surviving. And that's all it was. It was like, you're so present. It's like, Oh, let me think about my taxes here while I'm in the middle of throwing up again for the fifth time today. You know what I mean? You're just surviving and you're just, you know, and all I did was sleep. I mean, I just, when I, when I could sleep, I mean, I slept 12 hours a pop and then I would lay down and, and I try to eat some food. So you know, you're just in survival mode. And then when you had to have enough, and then you had to, you know, get dressed and go to the physical therapist or go to the doctor or go to the laryngologist to get your balance tested or your ears tested or something. It, it's just, it's just, you're so miserable that you're so present. And then when it starts to improve just a little, you're filled with so much, like when the Bell's palsy came, it's like, and I'm, I, my glass is half full, man. I mean, even when I was a kid and I was getting the snot beat out of me and I couldn't get I couldn't get past a C plus on any, any test I ever took or or, you know, whatever, whatever hell I was going through. I always assumed and everybody has that internal voice. You know, what I mean, everybody you have it. I have it. everybody has that sort of, you know, that and a lot of people have the internal glasses half empty voice, which, you know, that's sort of that constant. You're constantly in fear. You're constantly in a state of pessimism. You're, there's the sadness and depression that are over those people. And even though I'm getting the crap beat out of me, and even though I had Ramsey Hunt, and even though I lost 25 pounds and I couldn't exercise, there was always a voice that's like, oh, this is going to, eventually this will get better. Because at that point, it wasn't like I got that as a 20 year old and I'm in my apartment and I've got no, barely any friends and any, no money. I had resources. So I had my wife and I had all the experts. And, you know, so I just kind of relied on them. Um, my wife was really the, my rock at that point because the, the experts were winging it. You know what I mean? It's, it's, and a lot of people who end up with Ramsey Hunt syndrome and bilateral vestibular hypofunction don't recover. They become recluse and their balance issues are crap forever. And a lot of them who get Bell's palsy, that never goes away. And, uh, and mine took four years and I still will have issues. And, um, but like if I have an issue now on a scale of one to 10, let's say a 10 is I'm debilitated and I can't. I can't, you know, it's really bad. And I feel like a drunken sailor on a cruise ship in a hurricane or something. I never have that, but I'll have a three on a scale of 10, which is, whoa, you know, and you think, all right, well, this is a three. It's not a 10. You'll be fine. Just go work out or go meditate or, or go eat a healthy meal or just watch some TV. You know, there's always, there's, there's things that I can do. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was horrible, but I, I didn't freak out about it. You know, I mean, it's just that's because of the because of all the decades prior, all the behavior prior, all the the discipline prior, all the personal development books that are behind me that I read. You know what I mean? Um, the ones that are on my desk, right? Keith, Ellis, this this book changed my life. You know, this I don't know if you know Keith Ellis's book, The Magic Lamp. Should have him on. Holy smokes, he's amazing. Um, but uh, yeah, and so. Glass is half full, even when I'm getting a snot beat out of me, man. And because uh, you have to, you know, not to say that I don't have moments where I question myself, like, you know, hey, let me start my own fit- fitness program, you know, with, with a bunch of strangers from around the world on a Facebook page um, and have to shoot these things during a pandemic with masks on, you know, what I mean, like, who the hell is doing that? But it just uh, let's give it a try. You know what I mean? Uh, and I think that's the reason why I'm, I'm successful now compared to who I was before, because I'm not that much brighter than I used to be. I mean, there's certain lessons that I've learned that I don't make those mistakes anymore. It's just, just saying yes. And, 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 and then saying yes again and saying yes again. And then hopefully learning from the lessons that when I said yes, it didn't turn out so well. Okay. Don't say yes to that again. <laughs> you know what I mean? Say yes to something new, you know? And, uh, and so far it's working out, man. Would you say that going from a point of feeling so good and being so fit and healthy to it sounds like pretty quickly your health degraded extremely? You know, in, in in a week. In a week. Right. Yeah. Did that and does that still put your mortality like front and center? 
did you have to face your mortality at that time and, and still carry that with you? Like what I'm getting at here is you must realize, and a lot of people won't necessarily have this unless they run into a situation like this where, you know, I'm not invincible. And, and that actually, in my opinion, can be a good thing to think about, you know, the fact that, you know, you mentioned earlier, the different parts of our life and different chapters, thinking about death and the fact that, you know, we're going to die can be a great motivator to be in the present moment and to kick ass at what you're doing and what's right in front of you. So do you think that kind of had a shift on, on your mentality in that way? Did it have a shift on my mentality about mort mortality? Like my, like, did it make you face the fact that you're not invincible and like, okay, this is, and you make you think about that and, and how that maybe changes your perspective and where you put your energy and how you focus on things. You know, I didn't, I didn't feel all that invincible prior, you know? Uh, um, yeah, I, I, I have a very uh, low pain threshold. So <laughs> I don't know how other people were reacted to this thing, but you know, uh, uh, yeah, I was like my father, my father would get a cold. You think he had, you think he had, you know, um, pneumonia or something, you know, the way he would respond. And I was the same way. And you, and it, which is really funny, which is why, why I'm, uh, like when it comes to exercises, even when I was progressing, I never would go to the max. I'd always come up, I'd always come a rep or two short. You know what I mean? Because I just the physical pain of it. But then I was always tracking, okay, I can do one more rep. I can do one more. I can add five more pounds here. So, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I didn't really think about it and I still don't. You know what I mean? Because if you're in the moment and you're present, you're just dealing with what you have as opposed to, oh, wow, that was really brutal. And, uh, oh, man, I, what's, uh, oh, is, is it, uh, am I going to be thinking about my, my demise and my final death? Uh, no. I, I can't. I mean, a lot of people do, you know, especially as they get into their 60s. I think that's the reason why their worlds, people's worlds and life gets smaller and smaller, because the majority of their life is done. I'm, I'm, am I going to get to 72? Probably 82, hopefully 92. I don't know. That's 30 years from now. And the last 30 years went like this. I mean, I just turned 63. I'm going to be retirement age in two years. I'm like, what? I'm going to get discounts, though, man. I can't wait. Um, so, yeah, I just keep fighting the good fight. And I keep eating really right. And if something hurts, then I foam roll it or I get the Theragun or I get in the tub or I get in the infrared sauna or I get a massage. And I just, you know, so far, you know, when, thing, when things feel like the aging process is accelerating, I have been up to this point, been able to manage them. You know, like, for example, I had this sciatic thing that before I used to let just bother me and bother me for days and days and days until it went away. But yesterday I... I put the guy foam rolled it. I got in the Epsom salt bath. I, you know, I, uh, I did all these Egoscue. I don't know if you're familiar with Egoscue or not, but, um, exercises and mobility exercises and physical therapy. Cause I have a, this Holly Silvers is my physical therapist that I try to see once a week. And, you know, when you've got tons of information that most people don't have from various sources and, and you do them and they work, it kind of keeps your mind away from thinking, uh Oh, I'm getting old and I'm going to die eventually. You know what I mean? Even if you've got Ramsey Hunt syndrome, you know, and that's the reason why I've recovered so well. And other people who have what I have don't is because they don't have the, they don't have the, the infrastructure or the, or the knowledge, um, or the panoply of Intel that I have, that I apply to my life. You know, I don't have a problem. Oh, drinking done. I don't need that. Cause it's stupid. Um, drugs seems idiotic. I, why would I do that? You know, when I used to do both, <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause I was young and I wanted to have fun and I was really insecure and sad and alcohol and drugs and shitty food were the only salvation I had outside of just dealing with life. But then as you kind of get your act together, I mean, personal development isn't personal after a while. It's really get your act together well enough so that you can begin to help and focus on other people who need your help, who are looking for it, right? But then at the same time, the worst kind of advice to give is the kind that's never been asked for in the first place because your best intentions are received res with resentment. So I only give help to people who are looking for it, right? So that, you know, these are just things you go, okay, that's who I am now. That's who I am now. That's who I am now. These are all the things that I am now that are helping me and other people be happy and be, f and function well and have a, have a, have a, you know, have a more interesting life and all the other stuff that's every, and everybody's way all the time. 
you either decide to eliminate that crap or you don't. Um, and thinking about my mortality isn't on the list at all. It's not, you know. When you were in the throes of Ramsey Hunt and things were at its worst, would you say that was the most challenging time of your life mentally and physically? Absolutely. Without a doubt. hundred percent. A million percent. And coming out of that, did you have rose-colored glasses, seeing things in your life that were always there and having a new appreciation for them? Oh, yeah. Having I mean, that low and coming out, oh, yeah. like just, you know, giving your wife a kiss in the morning or the taste of your morning tea or coffee. Like, I'm guessing, and I'd like to hear more about it. It sounds like this is the case. It was, it was, you know, you were already, it sounds like a pretty optimistic guy, but this this elevated things. Well, you know, the, the thing is, when I when I was starting to get better after Ramsey Hunt and bilateral vestibular bilateral, I don't have to say the whole thing, it's vestibular hypofunction. Um, I knew what got me there. I, it's easy It's easy not to forget how you ended up there, how I ended up there. And that was because of the, the stress I, I, I wasn't dealing with properly. You know, I mean, there could have been, I always say to my, I always say, you know, ask for what you need. And I wasn't asking for what I needed. You know, I wasn't, I didn't have the wherewithal to go, wait a minute. Okay. These negotiations are going horribly. You know, um, it is what it is. What more do I need to do? And there was probably some things I didn't do that could have mitigated some of the stress from that. Um, but you know, when you're, when you're that Vegas shooting and when Tom passed away day after day, it was just too much for me. And so, um, when I came, when I was coming out the other side of this thing, yeah, of course I saw the world differently. I thought, what are the things that I need to do so that this doesn't happen again? And 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 the breathing techniques and the meditation were were part of it, um, and are still part of it. I mean, there's a there's a there's a practice that I have now that didn't exist before, and I'm pretty sure that that simple practice of you know breathing, like how how can that help? But it's just you know, you 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 talk to uh, um, James Nestor, you know the drill from him and. Uh, uh, and other books like it that I've read it since. Um, but still, here's what's interesting. Um, as time goes on and you're feeling pretty good for months and a, a year and a half or so, you sometimes, I sometimes forget uh, <laughs> how to react to situations. Uh, and, I, and, the old, and the old me comes up again because I am my father's son. I mean, my father was a, was a tank commander in the army and he was a you, you know, I don't know if you ever saw the movie The Great Santini, but that was my old man. You know what I mean? It's uh, it's one worth watching. It was just the relationship between the father and son. The father was a military guy, and they, and it just wasn't a very good. It was pretty uh, pretty intense. Um, and so you know, when when that's that's my DNA. Like there's aspects of my father that are in there, man, and 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 it goes all the way back from my grandfather, who was an exaggerated version of my father, and according and according to my father, my Great grandfather was a son of a bitch, you know what I mean? So, so you know, now I'm meditating. So it's it's we're you know it's changing over the course of time. So every once in a while, when I start to get a little in, too intense or or uh, too upset about something, you know, I think to myself, all right, last thing I need right now is shingles again in my ear, right? So you gotta you gotta chill, my friend. And so I'm 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 much more forgiving. I don't hold grudges anymore. I I reach out to to people I'm in conflict with and, and, uh, you know, especially now because, you know, uh, I, I don't know if you're from Minnesota or the Canada, but I can tell by your accent, you're from someplace North of here and uh, Ontario. Oh, you're on. So down here in the USA, we got a little division going on. You know what I mean? Uh, you name it, vaccination, COVID, the presidency. It's like, it's like that. Right. And so there are people, um, on the other side of where I, my, where my thinking, where I go, I don't even want to talk to you. I don't want to look at you. I don't want to listen to you because it sounds like nonsense to me. Right. And, uh, but then I think to myself, well, these are friends of mine. These are people that I've known forever. And I could either, I could either be that guy or I could just say, this is insane. You know what I mean? Like there's got to be common ground. And if you look for it, you always find it. You know what I mean? And so that is a less stressful, more upbeat, optimistic way to approach my life. You know what I mean? And there are friendships that sort of dissipated for a bit. And I went, no, 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 I can't do that anymore, man. And uh, and so we don't talk about all these other things. We just talk about what's, you know, food and diet and 
laughter and movies and and uh, and it's all good. And so I think if more and more people did that, I mean, I don't know how many people are getting shingles these days or Ramsey Hunt syndrome, but the numbers, the stress numbers are up, the suicide numbers are up, the weight gain numbers are up, uh, the alcoholism is up. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's it's a it's a you you against me kind of world, and it, it doesn't really have to be, you know what I mean? So, um, and that's that's the big shift for me. So, do I have rose co- co- uh, colored glasses? No, I mean it's a mess out there, but I have a I have a different, um, more productive approach to my life and and what's going on around me. And I think that's been and that started with Ramsey Hunt and all that kind of stuff. That's you know, and I, th- I think to myself, wow, I mean, forgiveness and love and thoughtfulness. And that's better than being a bonehead and yelling at people, you know. <laughs> you talked about your dad being a military guy. And it sounds like family, his dad, and maybe even beyond were pretty intense guys as well. Do you attribute a lot of your success and your drive for what you've accomplished to that mentality and having that instilled in you as a kid from your dad? To, to a small degree, but I, I'm self-taught, you know, I mean, think about it. My dad wasn't around a lot of the time and I didn't get a whole lot of lessons from him. And, and, but he provided a beautiful home and a college education and the, the, the Christmas tree was packed with gifts every year. And so was my birthday. And, uh, you know what I mean? Like my parents loved me. They just didn't express it the way I would have preferred. You, you know what I mean? And there was a lot of conflict in the house. Not a lot. I mean, you know, there's dysfunctional families are everywhere, right? And sometimes the kids end up exactly like their parents or worse, which is just such a bummer. And other kids prevail. You know, there's there's kids that woke up in single parent homes, right, with alcoholism, drug abuse everywhere. And they end up being, you know, uh, uh, stellar citizens of society, uh, because of maybe their peers or maybe a mentor that came along their way. Uh, that's why education and, and teaching and coaching and mentoring is, is, is really critical. You know what I mean? So many kids could go so south. And I just got very lucky. I think that, 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 that college weightlifting coach was one. Um, there's a, an acting coach of mine that had a huge impact on my life. This guy by the name of Daryl Hickman. He's 96 years old now. <clears throat> and now he paints. He's just an amazing man. And I took his classes for years. Uh, Brian Reese was another acting coach uh, that, I, that I had. Um, and these are just people that want to make me a better man, a better actor, a better performer. But they also, a lot of what they taught was uh, beyond acting. <clears throat> it was about being a man in society and, and, and having an impact on the world and, and, you know, working on getting your act together enough. And then, you know, for me... I was very lucky that I started exercising uh, when I came out to California. And, you know, like I said earlier in, the, in our podcast here, is, is that the regular exercise combined with healthier food um, changed my genetics. You know, because we, we live or die or the quality of our life is based on, on, on genetics, number one. But it's also behavior and environment, right? So my behavior and my environment is, is the antithesis of my of my ancestors and my father and, and, and down the line, right? Eat right, exercise all the time. And you're going to release, you know, you look at this, where, where is it back there? Uh, right here, man. This book right here. Boom. John Rady, Spark. I read this book and uh, he's, he's a friend now. I have lunch with him. And it's, he's a Harvard professor. Like, what am, I, what am I doing? I read a book. I think it's cool. He sees a photo of me reading his book on the beach. And he contacts me. And we have lunch. And he comes and speaks at my events. And he's this amazing man. He's got an incredible wife. And that, like those experiences, my father would never read a book like that about, you know, the effects of physical activity on the brain, you know? And uh, it says right there, the revolutionary new science of exercise and the brain. Like, wow. Supercharge your mental uh, circuits, beat stress, sharpen your thinking, lift your mood, boost your memory, and more. Like, wow, yeah, that I'm going to read. You know what I mean? Sanjay Gupta's got one out with a lot of the same science in it. So, you know, I, I'm, I, I think, you know, if you're going to stop learning after school, then then I don't know how your life's going to improve, especially if you don't have the like really upbeat, cool people who are trying new things in your life. You have the same friends from high school and junior high school, and you're not you haven't read a book 
since a math book, well then, yeah, what a shocker you're stuck. You know what I mean? Like, like and, and I'm not a good learner. I got AD, I, like I start reading a book and I, and I fall asleep. I go, okay, wait a minute. So I get an audio book, right? That I'm like, I'm not going to fall asleep during that. But I liked holding books. Uh, and my, it takes me a month to read a book. You know what I mean? And I've got four half-read books sitting around in my office here. But I just keep plodding along. I'm the tortoise, not the hare. I know that. My learning curve is very long. You know what I mean? I have a very a low, uh, uh, a low pain threshold. These are things I know about myself, but none of them slow me down. None of them do because... I like I like having fun and being happy and loving my wife and skiing and hanging out with my pals. So, um, and uh, yeah. What age were you when you got into personal development, and what was the catalyst there? It was your. It was I think it was an Andrew Weil book or something, uh, or a book I forget the author. Your erroneous zones or looking out for number one. I can't remember. It was um, the summer between my my junior. And senior year of college, so uh, I left URI University of Rhode Island in 1980, still six credits short. I've sold a billion dollars worth of fitness and written three books, and they still won't give me a diploma. But fine, that's fine. Um, I donate to the baseball team. Um, but uh, yeah, that was it. It was the summer. I was just, I was just like this book was thick. I was like, whoa, you know, because I was I read this first book, looking out for number one. I'm trying to think of the the author. I don't think I have it here anymore. But um, according to the book, I was doing everything wrong. Uh, you know, and I thought to myself, and every book I'd read prior to that was all about school, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic, right? And so this is the first ever, or novels. I was really big into, into um, uh, Stephen King stuff and, you know, those kind of books. Uh, uh, Richard, um, Richard, Carl no, Richard Carlson's uh, um, um, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. He's also personal development. But yeah, so I would I would read these not romance novels, but these really thrillers and stuff. I thought those were really kind of cool. But this was my first ever book, and I thought, wow, I'm not doing anything in here. None of it. This is crazy. Like this is a thing. Like wow, what if I do something really nice for somebody I don't get along with? Well, whatever. What if I, you know, what if I uh, focus more on you know these things in, in relationship to my finances or my or my relationships or or, you know, every possible, you know, category, I was way the hell off. I was just sort of a living by the seat of my pants, hand to mouth, you know what I mean? And so I just started to practice this. This, this book was my little Bible. And I went, oh, he's got another one, you know? Oh, who's this M. Scott Peck guy? I'm going to read that. Who's this Richard Carlson guy? I'm going to read that. Who's this Tony Robbins character? Let's see what this guy has to say. Deepak Chopra, huh? You know what I mean? Like all of it, uh, um, Eckhart Tolle. Let's let's read his stuff. Uh, Victor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning. What? Here's a guy that was in Auschwitz. That that while well, in a in a snowstorm, sub-zero snowstorm, he's out outside of the out of the out of the concentration camp with uh, practically no clothes on, and the and these Nazi soldiers are making him dig a hole in the rock hard ground with a spoon just to just to be a holes, you know, just and he would look up and the, and then they're hitting him with the butt of their gun as he's trying to dig a hole with a spoon in the snow. And he figures out a way to love these guys. He goes, he goes, this is just a man who was raised. He was a boy and he probably played ball and he just, you know, he came up with this whole philosophy on how to how to forgive people. And uh, I go, oh damn! I mean, if he can do that, I can be I can be cool to somebody who yells at me. You know what I mean? Like, wow. Stories like that make you reevaluate your problems. Really evaluate who you are and why you react to things the way you react to things. And it opens up your world. Like your world, you go from a pinhole to, right? It just gives you um, an opportunity to really explore who you are and prove who you are and make make connections with people who are who can change your life. And that's that's what I did. And so the answer was, you know, I didn't have you know, I had one, I had a coach and some acting coaches and some personal development books. And that made me, you know. Well, let's come back to the point in your story, what we talked about way earlier in our, our conversation here. And this is when you really got into fitness. You were in college and you took this class and you transformed physically. And I'm sure your confidence skyrocketed too because of that. Did you keep it up from that point forward or did you have ebbs and flows in the fitness journey? Total ebbs and flows. I mean, there were some periods there where it was rocketing pretty forward. You know, I mean, my my I, I was you know 
I got in shape, I stayed in shape, and I'm in shape ever since. I never got out of shape except for when I got sick or if I had the flu for for a week or ten days, and I got slightly out of shape. But it's only been in forty years, a couple of times where I was. I mean, exercising is a priority. It's 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 you know, most people are surviving, and people who thrive work out and eat right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but along the way, you know, I mean, I was I was when I first came to town. I was a runner for 20th Century Fox. I was an assistant manager of a men's clothing store. I was a handyman. I was a carpenter. I was a, I did pantomime at the pier. When I ran out of money, I would just get the hat and the clothes, and I put the pantomime stuff on, and I'd do the whole thing with rope and hanging out. and uh, Well, whatever, you know, I'd make fun of people to make $25 so I could live on yogurt and Cheerios for three days. And um, But I, did, I had every odd job under the sun, but then I started, you know, I got an agent because uh, you know, I wanted to be an actor. And the agent said, hey, you got to start working out, man. And I was like, OK. And I remember back in college, I had a general sense because of the class. And the gyms here were psycho. You know what I mean? Like in, in Rhode Island or in Connecticut, they were at the high school or they were at the college campus. But they weren't like, oh, there's a bodybuilding gym. There's an aerobics gym. There's a you know, another gym that's got something going on. And at some point, I was a member of four different gyms because I wanted, you know, I wanted to meet people and I wanted to meet a girlfriend. That's, so some girlfriends came out of some of these places, and and um, and then you know, then my boss, when I finally settled down to only like three jobs, one of them was a, a production assistant at 20th Century Fox. Um, I met, and my boss was by the, his name was Harlan Goodman, and his partner was Julia Phillips. And Julia Phillips and her husband John Phillips made The Sting with with uh, Robert Redford and Paul Newman. Um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which is, you know, which was huge. And then Taxi Driver with Robert De Niro. So all of a sudden I'm on the Fox lot and I got a pass and you know, movie stars are everywhere and I got a real job. But the job is miserable because, you know, I'm running around town doing errands and delivering scripts and hiding the pot or whatever they were making coffee, whatever a production assistant would do. And at that time I'm working out, you know what I mean? And, my, and Harlan, who was formerly in the music industry, Right. So my life was like eh, 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 right at that point. But I had this gig and, and I had a regular paycheck, which was cool, even though she would fire me almost every Friday and he'd have to call me up on Sunday night and go, you're not fired, dude. She's crazy. Like, so come on back. And I said, OK. You know, yeah. And uh, he was noticing that I was changing. And he said, hey, can you what do you, you look amazing since we hired you look totally different four months from when we hired you. And I said, I he said, can you help me? So I'd never trained a soul. Right. And I except myself. And I go, yeah, I'll just do with you what I do. And he lost 35 pounds. And, and I started training other people because they saw his results. It was like the word of mouth thing. And then um, I thought, well, maybe this is a business. Maybe I should learn more about what, what I'm doing as opposed to just spying on Arnold Schwarzenegger and Lou Ferrigno at World Gym and seeing what they're doing. And um, so uh, I got Harlan in shape and he left the movie making industry. And, and I left too because I was... I had other jobs as a bartender and as a carpenter still, and I and I was training people too, so it was one of many things. And then when he went back to East End Management on Sunset Boulevard, um, uh, Tom Petty was walking down the hall, and uh, as the story goes, I write about it in this book. And there's me on my book, and um, so Tom's walking. He sees Harlan. He says, "Hey, Harlan." you look fabulous. I, you, oh, what happened? And he goes, I'm going on tour and I'm fat. And nobody likes a fat rocker. And Harlan says, Tony Horton, man, I lost 35 pounds. You got to call him up. So, so Tom Petty calls me up. My roommate picks up the phone. Bob, he goes, hello. And Hey, it's Tom Petty. And Bob looks at me and says, dude, there's somebody downstairs screwing around. I said, hang up. So Bob hung up on Tom Petty call the phone call rang again it's Tom Petty. I think he got hung up on. So Bob goes, dude, I think it's Tom Petty. So anyway, the next day I'm at Tom Petty's house in Woodland Hills at his fancy place and gold records and platinum records on the wall. He puts out the cigarette in front of me and then we go to work for four months. And it was a tricky start because he had never lifted a weight or hit a heavy bag or any of that stuff. And, and, um, and so the story began and that was an up point. Like, oh my God, I'm training Tom Petty. And I got him, I had him for four months and I was training him and, and doctors and him and other people who used to be on the lot, like a secretary on the lot I used to train on the 20th century lot. And he looked phenomenal. He went off on tour and he was wearing vests without shirts and tank tops with cutting off the sleeves of shirts. It was crazy. He was frigging jacked, you know. And then Billy Idol called, right, mate, bloody hell, fantastic. I mean, what would you do to Tom Petty, man? Can you do that for me? It's my Billy Idol. And then, um, 
And then Tom Petty introduced me to Annie Lennox from the Eurythmics, and then Bruce Springsteen, and then Stephen Stills from Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, and then Allison Janney, and then Octavia Spencer, and and Bryce Dallas Howard, and you know, uh, there was a period there for a while when everybody was in town. I had Tom, I had Billy first, then Tom, then Annie Lennox, then Stephen Stills, then Bruce Springsteen, and occasionally in between, I'd fit in Stevie Stevie Nicks. <laughs> so it was like. Yeah, man. So I was like, yes. But I was still, you know, driving all over town. I had to get a second car because my car was my old 66 Mustang. I just couldn't handle the abuse of driving all over town every day. And so I got a crappy old 84 Land, Cru Land Cruiser, which was like driving a boat. You know what I mean? But I, I was on top of the world. And and to be perfectly honest, there was at that point, this is it was better than doing mime at the pier. You know what I mean? It was better than having to build furniture in the garage for people. Um, um, but I was, you know, well, I was charging 40 bucks a person or 45 or something or whatever, you know, which was better than minimum wage as a, as the manager of the Oak Tree Men's Clothing Store, you know? So, um, so the, the, to answer your question, it was going like this for me, even though I was still in the same, it wasn't making enough money. I was beginning to pay off my credit card debt. Um, I was beginning to be able to afford ski trips. I was being, be, was able to afford some nice clothing and some shoes once in a while but i was in the same crappy two bedroom apart two bedroom apartment with a view of the convalescent home i lived in that apartment for 21 years it was my acting career that was happening sporadically very sporadically i got a bex commercial bex beer and i got a couple other little commercials and things little acting roles in these in these in these things but i was doing improv comedy i was doing stand up comedy and I, that's what i wanted to be i wanted to be a movie star i wanted to be jim carrey that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be Jim Carrey and Brad Pitt, all wrapped in one. But I wasn't talented enough or funny enough <clears throat> to do either one of those things. But I was trying. And so when I got on a knock on the door to work for Nordic Track, you know, a friend of mine was working for Nordic Track up in Minneapolis. I auditioned and they, oh, you're a trainer and, and you can read a teleprompter. Oh, you, those two things are rare together because a lot of actors don't know anything about exercise science or kinesiology or whatever. And a lot of, you know, fitness people can't read a prompter or hit their mark. And, you know, so I was able to do two things at once. And so that I had more time. So like, oh, yeah, that's cool. I'm training celebrities and I'm getting this gig in Minneapolis. And then I got a, I got a, a job on a talk, on a, uh, not a talk show, but I was a co-host of an Entertainment Tonight kind of a show called 360. And that was three cameras and a co-host and reading the teleprompter. So I was honing this skill over here. I was training the celebrities over there. So my life, you know, but I'm not really making a whole lot of money. Not that it was about the money, but it was an interesting time. And and to be perfectly honest, up up till three years ago when Beachbody decided not to keep me, it was going like this, right? Then I met, I met Carl Deichler, the now CEO of Beachbody. And he said, hey, let's do this little side project called Great Body Guaranteed. That sold. That worked. He paid me two thousand dollars. That was all he paid me. Then let's do another one. Let's do another one. Let's. let's I, I was. He, Carl used to be in the crew, and he used to be a coxswain on a crew thing. And they would have like power ten and power twenty. Let's. How many days do you think it'll like when you get Petty or Bruce Springsteen? How many days? I go. I need three months, man. If you want three months, well, that's ninety days. Let's call it Power Ninety. I go. That's a cool name. And I got a lawyer, and I got royalty checks, and all of a sudden, Power Ninety sold three or five million copies. Not right away. But all that training of all those celebrities and all those, every other gig I ever got didn't compare to the, when these royalty checks started coming in. It was absolutely, you know, hey, Tony, move away from there. You don't have to live in that place anymore. So I got a four bedroom house, you know, with the view of the Hollywood sign and the guest. I mean, it was crazy. It was a, as a, as a client of mine would say, it was a cartoon like upgrade from where I lived. It was like usually, you know, this sort of little steps. This was like horrible insane, but I didn't have enough money for furniture. So every time you walked in one of the rooms, it was like, so this, this, this is the living room. We're living room, you know, so it was just terrible. Then we did P90X and forget about it. You know, it was, it's, it was a cartoon. It was an absolutely, you know, insane. It was a, it was a fairy tale, but the fairy tale didn't start until I'm in my mid forties. So for those of people who are watching, right, and then they're in twenties or thirties and they're freaking out, just keep going, man, because it can happen at any time. You just got to be persistent. Um, the, the, so to answer your question, the ebb and flow of it happened when I got Ramsey Hunt and I had two houses and mortgages and expenses and, and, and that income went away. 
Um, and I got sick all at the same time. Um, but you know, my glass is half full. So, you know, I just, I did, I had enough money. I mean, I had to pull out of my savings and pay bills and, and you don't ever want to have to do that, but that's, that's what it's for, you know, for emergencies. Um, and, uh, and so now I have, you know, four, five businesses really now, as opposed to one where that I, that one company wouldn't allow me to do anything else with anybody else. My contract was so restrictive, <clears throat> right? Cause they didn't want me to do anything else to compete with them, which makes sense. That's, that was their prerogative. Um, but now be, as a result of that downturn, that horrible downturn, I'm in a better place now than I've ever been. And, you know, there's, there's somebody looking over me, man, for sure. I mean, I have something to do with it. And my wife has a lot to do with it, but I, I don't know. I feel like I've got archangels just sitting right here right now, man. Just keep going, dude. You're going to be fine. Well, I'm so happy to hear that it all works out in the end, but it's so important you share that story of all the years you put in, the grind, the ups, the downs, the not making any money, and then being in your 40s when things really took off. Yeah, P9X is I'm 46. 46. I even say it. Like, I'm 46 years old, like I'm some kind of old man. Now I'm 63 years old. I'm, you know, I'm on the older side for sure, but but yeah. Um Yeah, I I don't it's funny. I think that's just partly why I'm why I'm partly how I'm wired. You know, even when I was young and I was getting a snot beat out of me and I was terrible in school and I was f scared of my own shadow, I had a sense of humor. And the sense of humor was my salvation. And uh, if you've ever done P90X, you know, you, you get it. And the brand new Power of Four, it's Looney Tunes. I mean, it's hard workouts, but we have a blast. I mean, they are they're silly as can be. Because exercise is not fun for most people. And so I, I added the humor because it just made sense, you know, and... Uh, I added, I added ridiculous amounts of variety and I added humor and good cast members. And that formula from great body guaranteed to present still, still works for me. Talk about that point in your career when things really did pop off and the money really came in quick. Going from somebody that, you know, never really had money and, and you know, you were just scraping by a lot of those years. Was it a big training period in your life, learning how to handle that money properly. You mentioned getting the place by the Hollywood sign. And did you have lessons to learn when that money came in the way it did? I had lessons to learn that I didn't learn right away. So I pulled sort of an MC Hammer, um, <laughs> a Wesley Snipes spending thing. You know, uh, I had an accountant who didn't really like, write that off. You can write that off. And then I got audited for three years in a row. And I was writing checks for like, you know, six figure checks back to the IRS. So I screwed up. A, I had a bad accountant, but then I had bad behavior with a bad accountant. That wasn't good. And then I got a good accountant and I called him my financial dad. Hey, Mike, can I? No, no, you can't have a Ferrari. No, here's why. If you do, you know, you're going to be right back where you were. So the, your car is fine. And uh, if you if you buy a Ferrari, uh, you have to get another accountant. Like that's how a uh, guy was awesome. But I would go to Barney's and buy, you know, six $500 shirts. You know what I mean? Like, duh. And those shirts sit in my closet to today. The only thing they're good for is to, something to dust. I don't wear, I don't wear, I don't wear dress shirts anymore. You know what I mean? And so I spent it, you know, you know, I mean, I had a crappy car. So I went right out and bought a, I bought a Mercedes Benz, you know, and, and other things. Um, so initially, no, I could have, I could, re I, I could have retired by now if I hadn't bought so much silly shit, honestly. And, um, but it was fun. I don't really necessarily regret it. I th thank God for, for me. I'm knocking on wood throughout this entire interview, but it, I got the right people around me at the right time who said, you got to cut that stuff out, man. And, um, and so, but you know, when, when the beach body, uh, wave came to shore, you know, I went knocking on doors and it wasn't that hard because people knew who I was. So they said, oh yeah, we would love to do supplements with you. Oh yeah, we would love to have you on Tonal. Oh yeah, you know, we would love to sign up for your new Power 4. Oh yeah, well, let's make some fitness equipment. That'd be really cool. And so um, it's just a matter of matter, matter of managing all those things. Um, so yeah, it was, it was uh, now I have my act together that way, <clears throat> but I still have to work my ass off uh, to keep everything. You know, I, I mean, I could have downsized you know, the house that I'm in now is, is a, is a cartoon, you know, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> but it's a beautiful home and, and <laughs> a lot of room to spare. And I need an intercom to talk to my wife. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, uh, not to pat myself on the back, but I tell you how 
beautiful my home is, but it, it it's stressful. You know what I mean? Like people think, oh man, if I had this and I had money and I had power and I had fame, fame, fame is about the last thing you want. Power is usually abused and money will exaggerate kind of who you already are. So if you're kind of a, you know, if you're kind of an a-hole, you'll, chances are you might be a bigger one. So you got to be really careful with all this extra, extra, you know, gravitas. You got to be really careful with it. And initially, you know, I was always an upbeat, funny, silly guy. And I, I, I don't care. I don't have any wealthy friends. I don't, no, I don't have, I, I don't, you know, no, I just don't, I don't <laughs> for some reason. I'm not going to get into why, <clears throat> but I trained a lot of wealthy people. And man, they had a lot of issues. Like they have more issues than I had when I was poor. And I went, ugh, these folks are uptight. You know what I mean? Like, wow. Um, Cause you're trying to keep up with, once you got it all, like think of all the, these rockers and all these movie stars and all these TV stars, right? They're, they're nobody. And then there's somebody and then they're nobody again. <laughs> like, oh, I can't live there anymore. I can't have that car anymore. I can't go to those places anymore. You know what I mean? Like, there were, like it's, there's nothing worse than going from here to here back to here. And so that's why I, I work so damn hard and keep going. And, uh, um, and, and you know, I, the, the diet and the exercise and the meditation and the, and the work ethic and all these things and having the right accountants, you know, these are, there's so many lessons learned, you know what I mean? And so, uh, uh I'm just trying to do everything right. So I didn't end up with Ramsey Hunt syndrome again, you know? Um, and I, if I had to downsize, I would, you know what I mean? Whatever. Um, so, but I still want, you know, I still want to, I want to still give my wife, like my wife and I have this thing where I say, honey, what's my job? And she'll say to make my wife, my, to make my life awesome. And I go, damn straight. I just love providing for her the lifestyle that she never had. Cause she, her life growing up was, I look like a, you know, I grew up in a castle compared to what her life was early on. So it's just, I love her to death and she's, she's my world and she's helped my business grow, you know, post beach body. She has done all the work really. I mean, I show up, hit my mark. I develop things and whatever. I'm good at that part, but she's good at all the behind the scenes stuff. So I just want to give her like a nice little place in Wyoming with a horse and a, and a stream and a, and a pond. That's, that's the next level, right? So you're always kind of looking to the next horizon. What I have is great, but you know what I mean? I'll, I think I continue to, I can continue to work hard without creating too much stress in our lives to, to, so in our final years on this earth, we can really go, hey, that was a hell of a journey. Look what we have now, this nice little, this nice little, I don't know, ranch or whatever, but someplace uh, where she can be, you know, a hundred feet from the horse. That'd be, that'd be a nice thing to be able to do for my girl. I know you guys got married at a later age. How did you end up connecting and uh, when did that relationship begin? 13 years ago, our anniversary will be six years um, uh, coming up uh, in October. <clears throat> and, um, yeah, I mean, it was, a uh, there was a friend of hers who, who, uh, introduced us. So it was a mutual friend and it was, you know, kind of a blind date, I guess. So, and I had just come out of a wacky relationship. I mean, this, this gal that I was with was, I won't get into what she was like, but it was just a bad thing for me, you know? And, um, it was, a, you know, it was like, oh, I don't think I'm ever going to get married. And I was 50, 50, 50. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 13 years for 63. That's the math. And uh, she showed up at the door and I was like, whoa, you know, she's a, she's a tall drink of water. And, uh, but funny and smart and just great company. And just, we were, it's like I knew her forever, that kind of a thing. You know what I mean? And so um, just a blind date. And then we went on another one and another one. And then she lived in Arizona and I was in LA and we had this long distance relationship for a while. And then she moved in to the, the the place with a view of the Hollywood sign, and and that was my place. I had that place completely at that point. I had it all tricked out. There was no room for a, a painting or a like. I gave her that much space in my closet. You know what I mean? Like there was nothing. So so um, that, there was a you know a lot of changes there. So she had to sell a bunch of stuff and put a bunch of stuff in storage, and then we just started looking for houses. You know, like our house, not my house. And uh, right after we got married, we just we found this place we're in now and. And, uh, and we've been, you know, it's pretty amazing. I mean, we have a, I don't know if you ever knew that comics bit where she, my wife's a unicorn. She's an absolute dude. You know what I mean? In so many ways. Doesn't hold a grudge, not a jealous bone in her body. Um, which is, I've not experienced that much in my life. Just a really good hang. Like we travel together as well as any 
two people can. You know what I mean? We just get along. You know what I mean? And humor is our – and yeah, no grudges. No – you know, we have arguments like some relationships, but but our thing is pretty spectacular. And I knew that, you know, and had, having been single all the way to 50 – I had to wait quite a few years to go. All right, I gotta. I'm not gonna, you know, put a ring on your finger in year two. So in year f- six, <laughs> she's like, "Are you, you know, are you gonna do this thing or not?" Because I don't, you know, I'm not. I'm the Marion type. I'm not one of these live together for the rest of our lives type, and uh, which would have been fine with me. But then now that I'm married, and it's it's glorious, man. It's just been. I feel I'm just lucky in so many ways. She's just such a great lady, you know. That's incredible. And when you guys met, was she really into fitness? And, and how has that evolved over the years? No, not really. Not really. And she's not into it that much now. You know what I mean? You would have thought that I would have married some kind of like ex-Olympian or something. You know, there, if, you, if, you look at your, if you look at the list of things that you're looking for in a partner, um, you know, she's very conscious of, of her physique and looking good in clothes and being fit enough to go on Mike mountain biking rides and ski and stuff, but she's not shredded or any of that kind of stuff. And I date, I dated fitness people before. And the ones that I dated weren't the kind of people that I wanted to be with. You know what I mean? Um, uh, they were just too intense or something, you know what I mean? About it. Or they were competitive with me, which was weird. Not to, not to say that I might've found somebody else that wasn't like that, but but yeah, no, she was uh, she was a model, you know. So she, she spent a lot of time in Europe and Japan, mostly modeling, and she was living on salads and cigarettes, you know, back in those days, just and doing getting on the elliptical twice a day for an hour, like this, all because of her, the agent. So you got to be you got to be 109 pounds. Like when you're five nine and you're 109 pounds, and that's not even your genetics. That's that's just cruel to to make somebody that thin. So now she can be the weight that she wants to be, and. And she can do her her Pilates and her yoga and her Orange Theory and her, and her um, Agoscu stuff, and she's very content with her level of. Sean is hypermobile too, which is, you know, she can put her foot in the ceiling and do splits without even practicing. She's just sort of genetically set up that way, so she has an advantage genetically. She could have been a great track athlete. She could have been a great anything. She's just super, and she didn't have any of that as a kid. Cause she had, she had to, she started working at 12 cause her father left when she was three and it was her and her mother and they were bouncing around all over Scottsdale and Phoenix and stuff. And, um, so she didn't have an athletic start, you know, she was on the track team, but then they moved. And so then she wasn't, um, but she's, you know, she's a, like, we went on a bike ride in Jackson hole and you know, she doesn't ride bikes. So I don't, we, she's, I couldn't keep up with her. Like, what are you doing? Is there something, what's with that bike? So I switched bikes, still couldn't keep up with her. She's like, what is going on? Do you understand who, you, you know? And she's like, yeah, but she's not that interested in it. You know what I mean? So, um, but she does enough to, you know, stay fit and, and healthy. And that that's fine by me. Let's end on a practical note here for somebody that's listening or watching. And maybe they're, you know, somebody who's never really gotten into fitness and exercising, or they're somebody that has, but they're, you know, they've ebbed and flowed, like we talked about earlier. And right now they're, they're out of the routine. What for somebody like that, who is just at ground zero right now, what would you recommend to them for getting into this and building some inertia? Uh, Grab a piece of paper and a pen. And uh, at the top of it, write these two words, my purpose for getting healthy. Forget about getting fit. Forget about losing weight. Just my purpose for getting healthy. Because you're going to lose the weight and you're going to look better. And that's automatic. But you don't want that to be a priority. So if your priority is is aesthetics, I got to lose 25 pounds. I got to lose the. I got to have a bigger arms. You know what I mean? That's all ego, right? Your ego, if your ego is run on the show, then it's just going to be a nightmare for you. So, you, you know, you might lose it temporarily and then you'll gain it back or worse. And so, you know, um, why do I want to be healthy? And then you write down your purpose for exercising other than weight loss and looks. All right. Those cannot be your reasons why. Just I'm telling you for my family, for longevity, for, you know, just to, you know, because I'm sick and tired of having inflammation everywhere because I, cause I can't climb up a damn set of stairs, you know, cause I'm so out of shape, Wh- whatever, you know, whatever it is. Um, and then on another piece of paper, write all the reasons why you should and why all the reasons why you shouldn't. And I'm guessing for most people listening, their should list is going to be a whole lot longer 
than their shouldn't list. And I know a lot of people have done this. My friend Jeremy Yost did this years ago prior to P90X, who weighed almost 400 pounds. He lost 180 pounds. His to reason why list was, was three times longer than his why he shouldn't. And so you have to just, this is your words. These are, this is, these are your thoughts and they are down on paper. And, and, if you, you know, and, and if you know what your purpose is and it's for all the right reasons, other than your ego and aesthetics, um, then maybe you'll get going. And then you need a plan. You need an, and so P90X is a plan. X2 is a plan. X3 is a plan. Power 4 is a plan. Insanity is a plan. There are programs out there for 60, 90 days that exist. And then you go do one or you go get a trainer. Who's you know what I mean? Like if you can't, if you're not self motivated at this point, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, if you're not a, if you're not a, uh, if you don't have a kinesiology or exercise science background, or you're not a trainer, then you got to go find somebody else to do it. And just somebody who's lifting weights in his garage might not be your best option. You know what I mean? Go find a professional. I'm there. You can go to TonyHortonLife.com. That's TonyHortonLife.com, and there's about nine thousand options because I've been in this business, you know. It's, for 500 years. Okay. So you can, you know, you can, you go to me as a source or somebody else who's in their neighborhood, who's, who's a trainer. All right. So then your plan should be, and this is the basics. This is the, this is all in the book. I would say, go buy the big picture by Tony Horton, because they're all there. Do your best, forget the rest, find your purpose, have a plan. Um, uh, and your plan should be 22 workouts a month, minimum 22. And you get a calendar, a wall calendar, and you get a red magic marker. And you put the wall calendar up and it's, you know, it's going to be hard to find a 2021 calendar right now, but you'll have to maybe start in 2022 or maybe you've got a wall calendar and you, every time you work out, you put a red X and at the end of the month, you got 22 X's, you're moving in the right direction because you've got to work out more days than you don't. If you work out three days a week, that means four days a week, you have done nothing. And when you have done nothing, the days off Unless you're, unless you're in your teens or 20s, are always going to beat out your days on. So if you work out 15 days a month and you take 15 days off, you might as well just throw yourself down a set of stairs because you're going to get sore, but not much is going to really change in any period of time where you're going to stay enthusiastic about it, right? So that's important. So make your plan and know what you're going to do, what time you're going to do it in advance. So on the calendar, and and, my, and all my programs with Beachbody and the new program is going to have a calendar. You write down what you're going to do and what time you're going to do it. You can put it in your phone. You can put it on your laptop, on your desktop, whatever you can put it. Just put a calendar in there. I have a calendar. It's sitting behind you and I right now. I know exactly what I'm going to do. I know when I'm going to get on a call with you. I know. My, and the first thing this morning was my workout. 7.30. There it was. You go and do it. And then you take a shower, make your hair nice so you can look good for Jesse. Okay. That was the next. But I had time between my workout. I had some food, but I wanted more food. So I brought a snack. And, and now you and I are talking. So this is part of the plan because most people have a plan. Survivors, they have a plan. They know what to do. They know, what to, they know when to eat. They do that every day. They know when to sleep. They do that every night. They know to breathe because they will die if they don't. They know that they've got to go to work because they got to pay their bills. And if they don't pay their bills, there's no roof over their heads. So then they become homeless, right? So, so these are the things that we do to survive. And those are great. But you got to flip it on its head and you got to make exercise. Exercise is the foundation. Food and exercise are the foundation of who you are if you want to not survive, but if you want to thrive. All right. So thrivers have a purpose. They have a plan. And they also, last but not least, and I'll finish with this, they have a way to stay accountable. So if you're self-motivated, there's a woman, Kathy, she lost 110 pounds and she was overweight and her husband thought she was wasting her time and stopped buying the silly stuff and spending our money on these pills and potions and bro, oh, you're going to do this power 90 now. But she would get up in the dark and go into her basement and she would do power 90 and she couldn't do any of it because she weighed over 200 something pounds and she was five foot one. All right. But she did it 90 days once, 90 days twice, 90 days, three times. Like what? With her husband barking at her the whole time. And then she did P90X, 90 days once, 90 days twice. When I saw her at a shoot, because we, we, her story was so unbelievable, she looked like a gymnast. She's like a 40-year-old. She was shredded. And I watched her do 13 pull-ups. When she started Power 90, she couldn't do one push-up on her knees, right? So you know, I mean, that's if, if and, and she managed to be accountable without any help, and she got on a bus to go to work. She got a bus. She didn't just. She got to get on a bus, so she was getting up 
in the dark and finishing in the dark and her husband saying, why? And I don't even know if they're still married, but anyway, um, so that's it. If you need a purpose that is substantial, like the quality of my life matters. I want to feel good. And you have to have that plan. You got to write down what it is and what time, and you got to be accountable. Me, if my, I invite people to my house every single workout during the pandemic, we did it on, we did Zoom workouts. And then, then we were doing them with masks and outside and social distancing and all this kind of stuff. And that's just what we did because we didn't want to, we knew the, we wanted to thrive. And some of my workout partners, I don't see them anymore because whatever happened to them in the course of these last 18 months was too devastating. You know what I mean? Like Sanjay Gupta calls them monks, drunks, chunks, and punks. You know what I mean? They just, they could have been hunks. You know what I mean? Like they could have done everything right and they didn't. So it's not easy. And exercise is hard. Eating clean is hard and it requires tons of time and you got to be consistent. Consistency is, is another one. You can't miss, you can't. And if you, the new program that I created called the Power of Four, there are stop options because some of them are an hour plus, but you can stop at 20 minutes. You can stop at 40 minutes. So I'm trying to make it easy, as easy for you as, as humanly possible, right? So, um, you know, there, there, that would be the advice for me. And I would just say, look, you know, not to push the book or to push my website or whatever, but, but I've been doing this for so many years and I hated exercise. I hated being physically uncomfortable. I hate running. I hate the first 20 minutes of yoga. I hate it. But what I love is the, sec the seconds afterward and how I feel and how much energy I have and how well I sleep. And that I have, you know, I have this lifestyle that is, it kicks the crap out of the one that I had in my teens and my twenties and thirties, you know? So that's my purpose. My purpose is to help other people find theirs. And if your purpose is spot on and you know exactly what you're going to do when you're going to do it and you got the right people around you, then you'll, you'll, you can change your life. You have to believe it too. You have to, there's a lot of faith in this thing, right? Because if you're overweight and you're miserable and you, and that's, and you've been that way for years, like the thought of you being something other than that almost seems impossible, but I've seen it happen thousands, not dozens of times, hundreds of thousands of times people turn their lives around. So I haven't met all 100,000, but I've met thousands of them. So it's real. It can happen. Um, so that would be what I would say about that, man. All right, Tony, great way to wrap up. Love it. Great advice. You mentioned the book, the website. How else can the listeners or viewers connect with you after the show? Well, you know, that that's, let's see. Um, I have it written down uh, on Instagram uh, at Tony S. Horton. I have to look at it. YouTube. I'm just Tony Horton and then TonyHortonLife.com. And if you're interested in my, in my supplements, which I didn't get that much into, but Power Life was a critical piece of the puzzle when it came to my health and getting my muscle back and my gut health. So that's MyPowerLife.com. You can go to MyPowerLife.com uh, to check that out. So yeah. All Tony right. Horton, TonyHortonLife.com will send you everywhere you need to go. Perfect. We're going to link it all up in the show notes. Tony, this has been a lot of fun, inspirational. You shared a lot of practical info there at the end. I appreciate the work you're doing and I'm happy to see you doing so well. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Thanks for having me on, man. I really appreciate it. Great questions. Sometimes podcasts are not so great. Yours were. So. Oh, I appreciate, appreciate that. Appreciate Thank you, Tony. That. Take care.